Oh, hi. It was really exciting. I just got my computer installed in my office, so I'm in my office at Skagit right now. You're welcome to come see me. All of these yellow um, bins here, those are all filled with rocks and minerals that I have spent many an hour organizing, and I'm very excited about it. Um, but it's five o'clock on Friday, so I'm the last person here, but I wanted to get this done, and I thought, well, it's this or drive through a bunch of traffic to get to Bellingham right now. Um, and honestly, I was so excited about this module. I was like, let's just, let's do it. Let's try it. Um, let's try it in my new office. Okay, so this week we're going to talk about water availability and water usage globally, um, regionally. Um, I'm really excited about this module because water is such a cool uh, chemical substance. I'm a chemist, I'm a geologist. So in both capacities, water is such an interesting and an important component. Um, but in terms of environmental science, it goes much further than that, right? It is, it is an integral part of our, of our life. We, we literally need water to survive. I'm drinking some right now. Um, so I was really, really excited about this module because I'm very passionate about it, very passionate about, um, water usage, um, and how it's inequitable across the globe as everything we've seen so far sort of is, uh, but I'm going to talk about it in all of the different senses, chemically and geologically. Um, and you have a couple really cool assignments this week that I'm also really excited for you to do. So let's start because this is a chunky module. Um, so this was the Aral Sea. Uh, and this is near Kazakhstan. This is in Kazakhstan. Hold on. I brought it up on Google because I thought it'd be really cool to show you. So Kazakhstan's over here. This is the Caspian Sea. Um, I guess let's geogra geographically locate us here, Saudi Arabia, this is Africa over here, here's India. Um, so the Caspian Sea is huge, right? It's, it covers quite a bit of area here, this Caspian Sea. The Aral Sea is over here. And you can even see where the Aral Sea used to, I think it's Aral, I don't know if it's Aral, Aral, whatever. Um, you can see where it used to sit, this whole region. Uh, and over time, obviously, now we have cities there. But over time, it has dwindled and dwindled and dwindled. But uh, originally, it did cover this entire area that is now left with a salty rind, essentially. So this is this white that you see. It's all salt residue um, because this was a salt sea. So here's what's left of the Aral Sea. Um, and here's where it used to be. And the reason is... Um, That wasn't salt. Was it salt? It has to be salt. It's not snow. It has to be salt. It has evaporated. I think they were just using this. Um, sorry, I just realized like we're, we're talking about water availability and, and it has to be fresh water for them to use it. But this is all salt water. I think they're just talking about how water is evaporating at a rapid scale um, due to climate change, um, regardless of whether it's salty or not. But the Aral Sea essentially is gone. It's it's dwindling away. So that was the point. Sorry for my weird pause. Let's continue. Um, I just wanted to open it with this picture because it is kind of daunting to think like, wow, entire seas are going away because of climate change, which is our water. So what is water? Um, here's our here's our water molecule. We have H2Hs, so water is H2O, right? So we have our two Hs and we have our oxygen. Um, and I think I've talked about briefly when I talked about climate change, we talked about how water was a bent molecule, right? Um, and that has to do with its polarization. So hydrogen is slightly positively charged and our oxygen is slightly negatively charged, which causes a slight polarization. It bends the molecule. And this contributes to the reason that it is a greenhouse gas, right? Because uh, gases will reflect um, or heat will reflect off of these water molecules and bounce back. Um, but as a water entity, like a liquid water in oceans, in rivers, etc., cetera, um, you have multiple water molecules, right? And they're bonded together with what's called a hydrogen bond. And this hydrogen bond's really weak. Um, it's not strong at all. It's really easy, which is why it's really easy to boil water. It's really easy to freeze water. Um, it is a it is an interesting component that makes water, gives water a lot of its... Um, a lot of its properties. Uh, and the hydrogen bond, just for uh, reference, I like to use this as a reference. You know, I used to be a cosmetologist, but still technically I'm a legal, legally uh, uh, licensed cosmetologist in the state of Washington. 
Um, the reason you can curl your hair with a curling iron, uh, if you have straight hair, or you can flatten your hair with, if you have curly hair and you want to straighten it with a, with a straightener, is because you're essentially breaking those hydrogen bonds as you move that heat through your hair and it's changing the form of your hair. Um, and that being said, if you get your hair wet, it's going to go back to its original state, right? Um, if you have straight hair and you've curled it, but you get it wet, it's going to go back to straight. Uh, and that has to do with the other bonds in your hair, giving it its actual shape. But the hydrogen bond is a temporary and very, very easy to break bond. And that makes up water. That's how water molecules are bonded. Um, it is another interesting, uh, it's another interesting molecule because it is one of the only, uh, I don't want to say just molecule, but only one of the only other components, I guess, of earth in which its solid form is less dense than its liquid form. Um, and that's because as water freezes, it forms this crystal lattice. So it actually expands, uh, its, its formation, which makes it less dense effectively. So that's why ice cubes float in water, which is kind of neat. Fun fact, when these ice cubes melt, this level of water will not change. I look really tired in this camera, though. Like, maybe it's the lights in here. Also, the lights will probably turn off at some point. Uh, my room has a lot to be desired, but it's it's great. I love it. Um, but I do look really tired. I'm sorry. I don't think I'm as tired as I look. It uh, oh, yeah. So here is water as a liquid on the right here. And these are the hydrogen bonds that are breaking and reforming constantly as a liquid. But when it freezes, it forms this crystal lattice. Um, and this is where these hydrogen bonds are, are more stable, not necessarily stable, but they're more stable. Um, and they form this crystal lattice, which expands those molecules, which makes it less dense as an ice, as a solid form, than as a liquid form, which is so cool. So what does that have to do with the rest of this topic, I just wanted to start off with water as an important component because your homework's going to really dive into water um, in the environment, not just as a human essential part of hum humanness. Um, hold on. Okay. So groundwater, this is where it comes into a geologic sense. Um, because groundwater, if you're not familiar, the ground is a very porous entity. It's very, uh, it has a bunch of open spaces. And that has to do with how normal so soil has a bunch of pore space within it. So earth materials can contain open spaces called pores. And the amount of which is known as porosity it is in these pore spaces where groundwater can occur, can form. Um, and if the pore spaces are connected, groundwater can flow from one pore to the next and the material would be described as having permeability. So this material, our normal soil, has permeability. Water can get through most of that material because of all this water space. Compacted soil, less so. Um, and you can take hydrogeology if you want. Hydrogeology was a nightmare. I needed integral calculus for that and it hurt my soul. Um, but it, it really dives into the different soil types and the different uh, sort of geologic mediums that it takes to get groundwater, but essentially most of the soil in our area, at least in the Pacific Northwest, have what we call normal soil, and we have a lot of porosity in our soil, which contains groundwater. Oh, there we go. Um, so the distribution of Earth's water, I think I've shown you this graph before, but in a different way um, at some point. So all of Earth's water falls into this category here. 96.5% of it is in our oceans, which means it's undrinkable because that is very salty. And that has to do with how sodium and chloride dissolve um, as a bunch of, with a bunch of other ions. It's just not drinkable. So it's all salty. This is not accessible for human consumption. But we do have 2.5% of our global water is fresh water. Uh, we also have saline groundwater and saline lakes. These are going to be close to the ocean. But we do have 2.5% of an entire Earth's water as fresh water. And in that 2.5%, most of that is actual glaciers and ice caps. 30% of that is groundwater. So a significant amount of our fresh water is groundwater. And then anything else is going to be surface water, like lakes, like rivers, um, ponds even, swamps. Those are going to be our surface water that's accessible. And in that surface, oh, it says it right here. I'm such a silly goose. 
So in that surface water, we have ice and snow. This does not count as glaciers um, and ice caps. So just regular ice and snow on our regular land. We also have lakes. Um, I think this, oh, soil mo moisture, swamps and marshes, rivers, biological water, atmospheric water, that all falls under this 1.3% of surface water. So essentially, 99% of the water on Earth is unusable. Um, and the 1% that is usable by humans is groundwater, primarily. And we can take some a little bit from lakes and rivers, and that's, those are important too, and we'll talk about that here in a second, but groundwater is primarily our, our source of water. Here's our water cycle. I think I've also shown you this one. I know I showed you other ones that were, I think, uh, the carbon cycle was like this uh, depiction as well. But this was a water cycle. It's pretty simple. It's nothing crazy. Most of our evaporation occurs over the ocean. We do have evaporation that occurs from fresh water, um, from evotranspiration, which is the trees and the plants evaporating water from their systems. But most of that evaporation is happening over the ocean. And it condenses into clouds, right? And then it moves over our continent. And then it dumps that rain back out into precipitation, whether that is rain, whether that is snow, um, and it can get into groundwater, it can turn into a river or stream, and it will eventually run back into our oceans. The water cycle. Um, this is a map showing annual, average annual precipitation. So how much does it rain? Um, and the highest is going to be the purples, purple areas. You'll see that this is happening primarily in South America, uh, a little bit in India over here. Uh, I don't know where these continents are. Our countries are a terrible person. I probably should do that. It's fine. Um, but this is here because the Amazon rainforest is in this area. Lots of percent. Um, this is India. We do have some. I think this is Nigeria, actually. They get plenty of water over here. I know that they're a tropical rainforest. Um, and then we, as you can see, get a bunch of rainfall too. And actually we, the little blip here, that's the Olympic Peninsula. They get a fuck ton of, of rain every year. They get so much rain. They're considered a rainforest, the Olympic Peninsula. Um, if you've never been over there, highly recommend. It is stunning, gorgeous. And it's one of the largest national parks in the country by area. Um, but it's, they get a bunch of rain over there. Uh, and so they're able to grow this incredible forest and have these incredible ecosystems in the Olympic forest. So we do get quite a bit of rain. And that's, I will say that in troubled times with climate change, I have no plans to move anywhere else because if anything happens, water is going to be the first thing people are going to fight over. Um, and we live in a region where that might not be problematic. Just saying. Um, so rivers, how do rivers come into this and why are they important? I love rivers. I love rivers so much. I think this is the Nooksack. It's one of the local ones. Nooksack or Skagit. Pretty sure it's Nooksack. Um, and it's actually this really fun color because this is called uh, uh, glacial till. This is, a, or not glacial till, pardon me. Um, oh man, what's the word? It's essentially uh, tiny, 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 tiny little particles. It'll come to me at like three o'clock in the morning. Um, tiny little particles that are coming from the glaciers, uh, from the, the sand and the clays of in the in the north cascades which is pretty cool um we live in an area that is dominated by what we call meandering rivers this is actually the skagit river and this is how it has changed from 1984 to 2012. geologically this is a really fascinating depiction um hydrologically and water speaking this is also really important because we know that our water systems change regularly um which means that the water available to us is also going to change I loved this gift. I thought it was cool. Um, another Skagit, uh, Skagit River meander. The meanders are just the way that it like uh, S's. It's there's this. It's sinusoidal. I call it sinusoidal, and it's this like up and down and up and down and up and down graph. That's how these rivers move. They move in a meandering sense. So that's just all this meander means. But the meanders change over time, and so the lighter blue is where the rivers have been previously, uh, and the dark blue is where it is now. I just think these are cool depictions of our local watershed. Um, river systems are incredibly important to understand where water is moving because that is going to that is going to um, contribute to where those those that groundwater is um, because groundwater does seep into uh, the ground. 
But if you walk past a river that's still kind of high on a summer day when it hasn't rained in like, I don't know, a month, like in August. Ah, sorry, I'm just adjusting. Um, in like August, and you're like, gosh, it hasn't rained. Where's this water coming from? Maybe the glaciers, sure. But we get a significant amount of our water in our rivers from groundwater as well, which means we're going to lose it really fast too, because that water can make its way to the ocean in days. And we need it to last months, years. Um, so understanding a river system, you're going to understand that water shed and where that water is going and where that water is being used. So this is the one um, just south of the Himalayas. Hold on. Yeah, because the Himalayas are up here. So India is here. The Himalayas are just north. Actually, it's this topography here. This topography indicates high mountainous regions. This is the Himalayas. This is the highest mountain range in the world. This is where Mount Everest is. I don't know where it is, but it's up here somewhere. Um, and all of this water is coming from the Himalayas, effectively. It's like, except for these guys here. These guys are moving. So. But effectively, most of this is coming from the Himalayas and moving out into the Bay of Bengal. Um, and the reason I have this one is, is mostly for sediment discharge because this carries a lot of sediment with it. But this is an important river system for the people of northern India and in southern China um, and Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar. All of these places, Bangladesh, um, all of these places rely on these water sources. And right now, um, a lot of these countries uh, are using more, especially India. If you remember, India has the highest population in the world, um, especially northern India. Uh, and northern India needs this water supply, and they're using it out very quickly. And that's a big problem. You're going to look at that in the lab this week. I'm really excited. Skagit River. Here's Burlington. Obviously, Mount Vernon's down here, but I like showing the Skagit River. This is our water. This is our fresh water system. Look at these old meanders. So the river used to be here, and it used to be here, and it used to be here. Got a little stream or creek here, I guess. It's just a great picture. This is our local fresh water system. And the Skagit is the largest in the Pacific Northwest. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say that. I say that living in Bellingham. It's bigger than the Nooksack. It is not as big as the Columbia. My apologies. Or the Fraser River. Um, but I guess between Bellingham and Seattle, it's the largest river between here and Seattle. So groundwater, back to groundwater, let's go back um, because I really want to, I wanted to emphasize where this groundwater was coming from. Um, and groundwater, please, no, go back. back. There we go. Um, a layer of earth material that has optimal porosity, remember has all those pore spaces within the, the sand grains and permeability. It's considered an aquifer and it's a source of groundwater. Um, so here we have a couple aquifers. We have an unconfined aquifer. So this is an aquifer that we can um, we can reach immediately. It's uh, going to be the shallowest of the aquifers. The water table is where that water, the groundwater ends, because there will be a layer um, in which we see uh, no water. So like the first few feet, you're digging away and you're like, wow, there's no water here. But you're going to reach a point where you get to a bunch of water. And that's called our water table. Oh my goodness. Sorry. This, so I'm doing this on my computer too. So I'm, I'm still learning the process here. Uh, a confining bed. So this would be a non-permeable uh, sediment. So like when I was showing the compacted soil, that's a confining bed. Water can't get through there. Um, and it's showing that water is getting through here in some capacity. But even if it gets through here, it's going to be a very slow process. It's not going to happen the way that it would in a, perme in a permeable uh sense it might have to find certain routes to take because the entire bed isn't permeable but maybe there are sections of it that are and this water table leads into a river and a river system or a stream system so the stream system is also at the top of the water table if that helps i'm um, sorry i skipped that one i'm going to come back but i wanted to show you this picture that i took i didn't take this just kidding that i have this is the nooksack river in 20 2021? I'm pretty sure it was 2021. So it's 2021 when those massive floods uh, hit Bellingham, it hit Skagit. Um, it was catastrophic. I think by the grace of gods, uh, only one person died in these catastrophic floods. It was in November. So wait, it is November. <laughs> I don't even know what month it is anymore, you guys. My life. My life is so hard. It's not. It's really not. Um, but it happened in November. We had this massive rain 
fall. Just a bunch of precipitation hit the mountains, hit us. Um, and what happened was the rivers weren't able to contain it. So we flooded. But that flood didn't go away right away. I'm like, but why not? Our water table was so oversaturated. So the water table rose. Let me go back. From here to all the way up past the actual ground. So we had water flowing along the riverside at the water table depth because the water table had gone up. Okay, so the water table moves. It adjusts to the amount of precipitation um, we're getting and to the amount of water that we're using. So at this point in November of 2021, this water table rose significantly because of the amount of precipitation we got. It didn't stay this way for months. It stayed this way for weeks, days. Oh God, I don't even remember. Um, it stayed this way for a while, but it did eventually settle back down and go away. And that had to do with both evaporation, but also just the movement through the river out into the ocean, into the bay, right? So our water table can rise. Um, we drill wells into aquifers in order to, in order to extract groundwater. Um, they typically have a limited amount of water and they recharge with new water or new precipitation, like what happened in 2021. Um, but it does make it sensitive to overuse. So we are using more water than it is able to recharge, than we're able to put back into the ground. Um, in some regions, the presence of groundwater is incongruent with the present day arid or semi-arid climate. And groundwater in these regions is described as fossil water. So here's the Colorado River. Um, if you're not familiar, this is the Grand Canyon. Uh, the Colorado River runs through the Grand Canyon. It is a huge source of water for the people in Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, and Colorado. Um, and one of our biggest problems right now is the groundwater availability in this region is dwindling to almost nothing. But we have a significant amount of people that live in Arizona, that live in Colorado, that live in Utah, that need this water. Um, but because this is such a dry and arid region and it's becoming more and more dry through climate change, um, these people are going to struggle getting water from their local water source, which means they're going to have to ship it in somehow. Eventually. So we are within, this is the Salish Sea watershed. This is our watershed. Um, and what you'll know is we're, we're covering this area that is the Western slopes of the Cascades. And that's essentially all of this topography taken into account. If it snows right here, um, this water is gonna drain, ooh, this water is gonna drain into the Salish Sea directly in some capacity through rivers, through streams, all of this, region is draining into our Salish Sea area, which is our fresh water source. So all of this green here, this light green, this is our fresh water source. Um, here we are, Mount Vernon. Here I am in Bellingham. Well, not right now, but I live up in Bellingham. So all of this area is super, super important to us. And that's going to be important when we talk about contaminants here in a second. But in general, the largest watershed in the Pacific Northwest, which was what I was getting at earlier, um, is the Columbia River watershed. So this whole area, and you'll see it goes up into British Columbia. We actually are, the Columbia River starts in Canada, which is crazy. Um, and these Rockies up in, in Canada. So this whole region depends on this water system that begins up in Canada and flows down. Um, and then all of this water flows into the uh, Columbia River, which is why it's so massive. And eventually that flows out into the Pacific Ocean. So the Columbia River is by far the largest water system in the Pacific Northwest, the largest river system. It's beautiful. If you've never been, highly recommend. I was born in Astoria. It's a really cute town. So those are our main water sets regarding our local area, okay? Washington, but also the Salish Sea region. And you'll note everything here was left out because this is Salish Sea, except the Western part of the Olympics, because all of that just drains directly onto the ocean. So water demand um, oh, of an area or a region is a function of the population and other uses of water. So it depends on how much how many people live in that area, right? In 2005, the U.S. used approximately 3,300 3, billion gallons, which is 3 trillion. I don't know why that was written that way. Um, per day for in-stream use, which is just water use but not removed from a river. 
We used 410 billion gallons for offstream use, which went to thermal electric power, irrigation, public supply, and industry. And then 100 billion gallons per day for consumptive use. This is drinking water. This is bathing water, I think, also falls into that. And also like dishwasher water, like that kind of water. The water that we use in our homes, consumptive use. So this is from USGS, the United States Geologic Survey. Um, and we'll see this is the withdrawal of water in billions of gallons per day and different years. So from 1950 to 2005, we see this uptick. Um, and let's see, the yellow is thermal electric power. So we're increasing because we're trying to find green energy uses, right? And thermal electric power is actually a really great green use because we're like, well, water is renewable. It is, sure. But there is a problem that goes along with that and that we are taking water that we need to be consuming and using it for power. So it's like, what do we do? We're not necessarily emitting any uh, carbon emissions that way, but we are taking water. So there's a give and take here. The green is irrigation and that has remained almost steady, but not quite, it's risen a little bit, but it's remained pretty steady throughout, um, gosh, the last eight decades. Um, so those are the, definitely the two top uses of water. Um, but then the total withdrawals are at the blue here. So this is how much we've withdrawn entirely. Uh, and that's in billions of gallons per day. I think this is, oh no, this is US. So this would be the United States, not global, but this is United States. It's a lot of water. I don't drink that much water. Probably should, but I don't. Um, this is freshwater withdrawals in billions of gallons per day, also USGS. So this is going to pertain to the US primarily. And this is the population in millions. So you can see that as the population has risen, the usage in water has also risen. Till 2000 and 2005, we've kind of dropped off here, um, which is good uh, in, a, in a sense. I don't know why it has dropped off, but you'll see there is a general trend leading upwards into usage and withdrawal. Um, I really liked this graph because this graph really showed, obviously agriculture is the highest usage um, for extraction and then consumption. What's crazy is we're extracting some, much more for agriculture than we're actually using for agriculture. Um, and same with domestic use. Uh, <coughs> oh, excuse me. So the extraction just means, uh, <coughs> oh my God, um, that we can return it and recycle it. But consumption is the final use of water after it can no longer be used. So extracting and being able to reuse that water is a good sign, but we are also rising on the amount that we can no longer reuse. And then a fraction of this water is lost through evaporation. Oh, and this is industry. So agriculture, domestic use, and industry are top three uses. Um, resource depletion is gonna be one of the biggest problems of water supply as you can imagine, because we have been using so much water in so many different ways as we just looked at all those graphs. This is called the cone of depression. In hydrogeology, it was one of the worst mathematical things they had to do, but it is important. Um, so essentially what it's saying is that if you set up wells, depending on the depth of that well, the deeper the well, you're going to, you're going to use more of that water. Um, which is going to drive that water table down, right? So that's what's happening here. But we have this cone of depression, which is lowering the water table even further closer to this middle well, which is deeper. Um, so these wells on either side are no longer able to access the water table. These are called dry wells because this well is taking up all of that water. Um, and this is just agricultural use. I don't know what they're trying to depict up here, to be honest, but it looks like agriculture and this is home, a home, a house. So resource depletion is going to be really, really problematic and how we deplete this water and what we're using that water for. So this is a map between 1995 and 2025. This is a projection um, where water stress, where we're looking at water stress and total available water. So water withdrawal is a percentage of total available water. So we are using anywhere from 20 to 10% in 1995, and we have jumped from between 40 to 20% usage, withdrawal and usage. 
Um, so it's watersheds. These are the countries that are going to have a high percentage of water withdrawal compared to available water. So we're withdrawing more water than we have available, essentially, is what this is saying. According to 2006 report by the United Nations, in 2005, 700 million people, which is 11% of the world's population, lived under water stress with a per capita water supply below 1,700 meters cubed per year. Um, and most of this was in the Middle East and North Africa. And we're going to show you, I'm going to talk about why here shortly. Um, so by 2025, which is in two short months. Yeah. I thought for a minute it was already 2025, but it's not. Um, reports suggest that more than 3 billion people, which is 40% of the world's population, will live in water-stressed areas with the large increase coming mainly from China and India. They have high populations and high densities of people. The water crisis will also impact food production and our ability to feed the ever-growing population. We're going to hit that carrying capacity soon, whether that's from food, whether that's from water, but it's going to happen. Um, so that's going to cause global tension and conflict. And conflict has already been happening because of water sources for, for decades now. Um, and this has been happening mostly mostly through the Middle East, Africa, Central Asia, and, and South Asia. As you can imagine, those are very deserty areas anywhere along that equatorial region um, where we see de deserts are really struggling for water. And we're starting to see conflict arise starting. We've seen conflict because of this, and we're going to see it continue. So what are some sustainable solutions to water supply? This is um, the Hoover Dam. I think it's the Hoover Dam. If I remember correctly, so a reservoir. Why do we even put up dams? Um, and I'm sure many of you are like, well, hydroelectric power. Absolutely. That is definitely one of the benefits of a dam um, is this, no, this low emitting uh, access to power and energy. But the real reason we started it was because in these dry regions, it would build up this reservoir behind it. And this reservoir was usable um, past drier spells. So if the river started to dry up, we could continue to use this reservoir, this freshwater reservoir, before it reached the ocean. Um, and it collected enough that many people could survive on this. But there are problems associated with dams, as I'm sure you have seen. Um, obviously, they're incredibly damaging for river ecosystems. And we started to learn more about, oof, I'm going to stand um, we started to learn more about, uh, like, can you, can we move my camera? Let me go. Um, about like salmon runs and salmon ecosystems and how those were pertinent to uh, a lot of other ecosystems within the oceans and a marine setting. And dams will fuck with a salmon's life cycle. Uh, we do have fish ladders, but like I don't remember which dam it was, but there was a dam down in the along the Columbia River that had a fish ladder, but you would literally just see seals and sea lions sitting outside this fish ladder because they learned very quickly that that's where they could get a lot of fish. So they're eating the salmon. It was like literally shooting fish in a barrel, except they're eating fish in a dam and a fish ladder. Um, so that proved to be entirely problematic. Uh, so ecosystem wise, it's not a friendly, ooh, got dirt everywhere. It's not a friendly uh, solution, really. Um, and the other problem, too, is these are definitely needed more in arid regions and drier regions. But the problem with that is this is just going to evaporate away uh, at some point, which is what we're seeing happening. Um, aqueducts are another possibility, and they are very useful. These are There's a bunch of aqueducts down in California. So they're an agricultural fix to bring water primarily to big farms who needed the water for irrigation. So they would they built these aqueducts. Um, starting at the location of the water source or the groundwater source, the river source, wherever, and they would funnel it essentially to these farms to use for agriculture. Uh, but the problem with that is then we're funneling water to one place, which leaves this other source completely barren. Um, and so it was actually causing droughts in other regions versus what we were using it for. It was a problem. Um, so it was a great solution for uh, uh, ag sorry, agriculture, but not such a great solution for a lot of other people. Um, desalination. This is a cool thing. And I know there are companies looking into this because um, it's already started this process. The downside. So it's essentially, as this picture depicts, it's essentially taking ocean water and removing all of the salt and all of the, the components from it that we can't drink 
and turning it into fresh water. Um, and you can do this on an individual basis just by taking, there's like a, I should set up a, a picture. There's like a, if you get stranded on an island and you have a plastic bottle, you can cut it in a specific way, put salt water in it. Uh, so the sun will evaporate the salt water and leave behind, or well, it evaporates the water and lets it drip down the sides into a drinkable thing. Because you can do that if you need to survive on a barren island if you're lost. But they're trying to do this professionally and, and industrially. And that's the problem, too, is industrially it takes a lot of energy and it's very expensive. So this might not be the best option moving forward, but it is something that I know a lot of companies are looking into. Um, just basic conservation, using less water and using it more efficiently. So high efficiency washers, low flow showers and toilets. Uh, I actually have a large, very, very opinionated opinion about the low flush toilets, especially here at Skagit. They're awful in Skagit. Where like you see a button that says, just use this one if you just peed or use this button if you have solid waste and you need to flush at a higher energy. Uh, I really hate them. Um, because I, I understand the, the idea behind them, but the problem is the lower flush system doesn't fully flush sometimes. And so people are just flushing it more and more and more to get everything down, whatever it is. Um, and so it's not really effective in a lot of ways because people are having to flush more with these lower efficient toilets, as opposed to just flushing once and having everything gone. So I have a lot of opinions about that. Um, but I will say that dishwashers are God's answer to washing dishes. Um, the overarching, like the, I think the, um, average dishwasher only uses like four gallons of water for every load. And if you are continually washing dishes in the sink, you're actually using significantly more water to do that than you would with a dishwasher. Um, so dishwashers are great. Use dishwashers. Um, but some of the other options are growing native vegetation and crops that require little vegetation irrigation i don't that require little irrigation i don't i don't know why i wrote that um rainwater harvesting this is also an interesting concept that um i imagine well, this is this is why living in the pnw is going to be so important in the future if water becomes super problematic um we can harvest rainwater and we can keep that and this was like a diagram oh not all of it's showing up but this is a diagram hold on i do want to Oh no, it got cut off. Well, that's okay. Um, that shows if you collect water, this is a collection area on top of the house, and then it's going to go through a system, and then you have to have a filtering system in some capacity to get rid of the bacteria and all of the organic compounds. But then you'll have a storage unit um, or storage uh, silo, essentially, that collects that water and holds onto it. And this will be important for um, individual water consumption if we need to uh, stop using like city water, um, if we're starting to run low on that, but it's also gonna be great for uh, like company holding water. That did not make any sense. Uh, I guess we'll just stick with, it. it's gonna be really great for individual water consumption. Not necessarily, I mean, if industries could do this too, especially in the PNW, that would be awesome. And I don't know if there are that are starting this, um, but that would be a really great start to conserving some of their uh, water usage. And also the growing crops in areas where natural rainfall can support them, which is what I said in the last slide. What the heck? Oh, it will help grow crop, crop. I guess if you're harvesting rain, that will help in areas that grow crops. Okay, water pollution. This is a big one. Um, according to the World Health Organization, in 2008, approximately 880 million people, or 13% of, of the entire global population, did not have access to safe drinking water, which is bonkers. But 40% of the population lived without improved sanitation, which is defined as having access to public, public sewage system, a septic tank, or even just a pit toilet. Just a basic pit toilet. 40% of the population didn't even have access to that. That's mind-blowing. So each year, approximately 100, or sorry, 1.7 million people die from diarrheal diseases associated with unsafe drinking water, inadequate sanitation, or even just the inability to wash your hands with soap. Almost all of these deaths are in developing countries, and 90% of those deaths are among children under the age of five. So this is a map of that. This is the deaths 
by country from diarrhea caused by unsafe water, unimproved, unimproved sanitation, and poor hygiene in children. So this is deaths per 100,000 children, and it's primarily in Africa and primarily in the Middle East here. That's crazy to me. Ugh. I mean, I know why, but it's still heart-wrenching that this is such an issue around the globe. So the different types of pol pollutants that get into our water, we have point source pollution, we have air pollution, we have eroded soil and sediment. We're gonna talk about most of these. We have wastewater, runoff, seepage. All of this is gonna make its way into our river system and eventually out into our oceans, which is gonna fuck with the ecosystems in the ocean. So what's a point so source of pollution? These are gonna be animal farms with a large number and high density of livestock, such as cows, pigs, and chickens. Uh, I mean, so before I go on to the other ones, think about how much shit these animals are producing. And there's a lot of bacterial and uh, potentially dangerous contaminants within these animals' feces, um, depending on what they're eating, depending on how they're taken care of. So it's it's incredibly dangerous to have, especially if they're out roaming, which I would love. I want these animals out roaming. But if you have a high density livestock out roaming in a field and they're pooping all over this field, that's going to seep into the groundwater and get into our river systems. Discharge pipes from factories. Um, some of you are looking at contamination from the oil refineries for your project, and I would love for you to look into this. I, I don't know that the oil refineries are around here are necessarily discharging um, contaminants from pipes, but it has been an issue in the past with other oil refineries around the world. Um, sewage treatment plants, obviously this is a problem. Oh, sorry, that's it, that's all there was. Um, versus non-point sources of pollution, um, which include agricultural fields, cities and abandoned mines. Ah! Um, and the reason these are problematic is, so agricultural fields are problematic because we use fertilizers, right? Which have a high amount of nitrogen and phosphorus. I'm excited to talk more about that here in a second. Cities are problematic. Um, so actually one of the biggest pollutants that gets, gets into our waters from cities is this tire residue. So as you drive, um, this rubber material will actually come off onto the road and gets into the storm drains and eventually gets out into the rivers. Uh, and this is a big problem. I don't remember what they're called. I should find a picture of them, but they're, it's a microplastic essentially is what it is. Um, and it's incredibly damaging to the environment and, and to the ecosystems around us. Um, and they are toxic. If I remember correctly, there is a chemical in this tire component that's very toxic. So not only is it like a microplastic, that's just like a filler, right? We talked about that earlier this term and it just fills you up, but doesn't provide any nutritional value. It's also toxic and will poison you. And then abandoned mines, this is another thing we talked about in geology, abandoned mines, and you have a lot in Skagit. I know there's one up the mountain um, just around here, uh, but abandoned mines are also very problematic because uh, they, expose, they expose so much ground area that it actually exposed a bunch of toxins. And then they were like, okay, well, we're done mining here. So let's just move to the next mine. And so they left all of this area uh, closed off. So now all of those toxins are being weathered down into the water system. Big problem. If you want to talk more about geology, you should take Geology 101 next term with me. It's going to be fun. Look at all the rocks I'll get to play with. There's so many. Um, oxygen demanding waste. So this is a little bit more chemically involved, but I won't, I won't dive too hard. Except I love it. I mean, I don't, but I love talking chemistry and how it's and how it, you really get a, a sense of understanding of what's happening at a chemical level. So oxygen demanding waste is extremely important pollutant to the to our ecosystems. And it's um, so most surface water in contact with the atmosphere has a small amount of dissolved oxygen. This is how fish breathe. So they if you've ever seen like a fish um, and it goes. They're essentially taking in water and they're um absorbing that dissolved oxygen into their bodies and then the rest of the water leaves their gills so that's what the gills are for it's actually like an exodus it's not like they're breathing it in through the gills they're breathing it out um, and that oxygen is remaining in their body and giving oxygen to their their muscles and their oxygen to their blood and all the important things so they need oxygen too but it's dissolved in the water they just absorb it in a different way than we do um Bacteria also, so bacteria will decompose dead organic matter and remove dissolved oxygen. So this is 
Okay, I wasn't sure why I just covered it. This is bacteria. This is a chemical formula for bacteria, CH2O. And that bacteria is going to consume oxygen as it decompose as it uh as it consumes dead organic matter. To do that, it needs oxygen. And when it needs oxygen to do that, it removes that oxygen from that system, leaving behind carbon dioxide and, and water, but that's removing more oxygen which leaves less oxygen for the other animals still alive to, to consume and to absorb. So that's what this chemical formula is. It's that I love chemistry and water. Nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay, let's talk this. I feel like I've talked about this before. Well, I have talked about it before, but I didn't dive into it because I was like, we'll get there. We have gotten there. So nitrogen and phosphorus, we talked about in, I think last week when we did farming, food and... Yep, 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 that was last week. So food and hunger and, and agriculture, we talked about nitrogen and phosphorus, were huge components of fertilizers, and they're also very problematic. So the reason they're part of, um, they're, they're huge components of fertilizers is because we consider nitrogen and phosphorus what we call limiting nutrients. So a plant is going to grow, and it's going to take in all these nutrients, and it's going to take in a bunch of water, and a bunch of sun, and a bunch of all these other things, carbon dioxide, right? So it takes in all these things. And it needs to grow, but it also needs nitrogen and phosphorus to grow. But it's going to run out of nitrogen and phosphorus first before it runs out of carbon dioxide or water or sunlight, which means that once it runs out of nitrogen and phosphorus, it stops growing. Or it slows its growth, waiting for more, right? So we add nitrogen and phosphorus into fertilizers so that it doesn't stop the growth of these plants, right? We want these plants to grow so we can eat them, consume them. Um, so we add nitrogen and phosphorus into these fertilizers to help, which does. So it helps grow this agriculture. But the problem is because it helps plants grow is it works its way back into the oceans through seepage, through groundwater, um, and forms what we call HABs or harmful algal bacteria. Yeah, HABs, harmful algae bacteria. I'm saying something wrong there. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Habs. They're called habs. Harmful algal bacteria. Um, and they grow. It grows. Why? It just something sounds really wrong about that. Harmful algal bacteria. Oh my god, because it's not bacteria. That's why. Oh my god, I knew something was wrong. Harmful algal bloom. <laughs> uh, maybe I am really tired. It's called a so they're called habs. Harmful algal bloom. Because all of a sudden, you get this explosive amount of algae blooming in the ocean. See, that's where it caught up with me. Uh, and while you're like, well, that's great. That's going to produce more oxygen. Because that's where we get 70% of our oxygen is this algae from the ocean. You're right. But if we get too much, what happens is it will gunk up the fish's gills. Um, it will also deprive, so these, these, this algae will sit at the top of the ocean while it's alive. And it's like, yeah, all this nitrogen and phosphorus this is amazing. We love it. And it sits at the top of the ocean. It sucks in all of this uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, but it blocks all of the sunlight from coming down into the rest of the water because it's so massive and there's so much algae here. So no sunlight can re reach this trophic zone, which is a problem. Um, so then the other problem is the, it'll die eventually. It dies, which is great. Um, and you're like, okay, well, now the sun can get to this, this area, but when it dies, it sinks. And remember when I said that as it six, six, sinks, bacteria will decompose this dead organic material and take in all of that oxygen. So we get what's called a dead zone. It's called a hypoxic zone. There's no oxygen here, which means that animals who need oxygen can't live here. So that is sort of the, uh, the, the, the stage of events where we start from a high amount of nitrogen and phosphorus and that is sort of this like domino effect of well shit all of this other stuff is happening and it's fucking up the bottom of the ocean um, in a lot of ways we have a big dead zone um, just off the west coast of Washington because of all of the agriculture here because of the nitrogen and phosphorus producing all of this we have algal blooms all the time uh, see it was even here why did I struggle with that I don't because I'm tired clearly uh, so that is a big, that's a big ecological um, and contaminant, contaminant pro uh, problem. Nitrogen and phosphorus. Here's what an algal bloom might look like. They're not always red. 
Um, most of the times we're going to see green ones. The red ones are actually can be toxic. So not only are we exploding with algae, but these ones are poisonous. And this is when um, maybe you've gone to the ocean and they're like, red tide, don't go clamming because if you eat the clams, you'll die. That's a that's from a harmful algal bloom. Um, and it's usually a red colored algae that then, of course, our filter feeders will filter out, um, eat this algae and then die. And it's poisonous. Pathogens. So these are diseases, disease causing microorganisms, including bacteria, viruses, parasitic worms, which freak me out, and protozoa. Um, and they can cause a varietal of intestinal diseases such as dysentery, typhoid fever, hepatitis, and cholera, all of which are deadly. Um, I shouldn't joke about it, but I did see dysentery and it's like, oh, that's what killed you on the Oregon Trail. Maybe I'm aging myself here, but um, if you've ever played the Oregon Trail, it's you have died of dysentery. It's not a fun disease to take you. It's a diuretic disease. So essentially it dehydrates you and you die of dehydration. It's horrifying. Um, so it's around 1 billion people are exposed to a waterborne pathogen globally. And keep in mind, there's what now, uh, probably like 8 billion people on the earth now. So this is one eighth of our entire population is exposed to a waterborne pathogen globally. That's crazy. 1.5 million children die of waterborne diseases every year. Enter the water primarily. Oh, I see. Pathogens. I see where I was getting here. So pathogens normally enter the water from human and animal fecal waste due to inadequate sewage treatments. That's why toilets are so important. That's why I'm glad we don't live in the Middle Ages. Obviously, these diseases were rampant in the Middle Ages when um, plumbing systems didn't exist. Uh, and so you were, you were going to get these diseases because you were drinking water or eating food that had pathogens linked to this. Oil spills. This is another uh, passion project of mine because as a geologist, you know, people are like, well, where are you going to work after you get a geology degree? And they're like, well, you can do oils, oil mining, or you can do, uh, sorry, oil fields or mining. And I didn't want to do either because both of those I felt like were uh, environmentally unsound. And they are, I mean, in a lot of ways. Um, this was a picture of the Deepwater Horizon explosion um, from 2010. Yep. There's a movie about it with Mark Wahlberg, I think. It was fine. Eh. It was more about the drama than it was the actual explosion. Um, but what happened was there's a giant pipe it's linked all the way to the bottom of the ocean and they're sucking out oil, right? And so that oil lit on fire and there was no way to stop that fire because the oil kept coming. Even if they shut off the oil, it was still a problem. Um, and then the other problem too was once that oil hits the, the water, Oil is significantly less dense than, than water. So that oil sits on top of the water and the water was effectively on fire. Um, and it's incredibly problematic. So oil is essentially, it's a hydrocarbon, which is a, a, a it's a, it's hydrogen and carbons, essentially, these lengths of hydrogen and carbons. Um, and they don't decompose very easily. Uh, which is why oil is still around. So, you know, you say, oh, I'm driving a dinosaur right now. That's what is in my car, right? Um, and we do get oil from dinosaurs. That's approximately the time in which oil started to really accumulate in our in our ground. Um, so it doesn't degrade very easily. And so the problem in the environment is if we let it out into the water, it's not going to degrade. It's just going to sort of disperse um, and really contaminate a lot of the water, including the oceans, but also including um uh, rivers and and uh, streams. And this is another problem with cities with all of our cars driving along a city. I'm sure you've walked through a parking lot and seen a really beautiful rainbow oil slick and you're like, wow, that's so pretty. Um, but it's a problem because it doesn't decompose easily at all. And it's just going to work its way into our water system. And we're going to drink that. Other contaminants are going to be arsenic, um, this is a form of bioaccumulation. We're going to talk about this in a second because I realize there might be some confusion here with bioaccumulation and biomagnification. And arsenic was a problem in the Bangladesh in the 1970s. Hold on, what happened? I remember reading about this and I thought it was really fascinating. So in Bangladesh in the 1970s. Okay, okay. Sorry, I had to look it up because I, I didn't want to tell you the wrong story. Um, so it's a really interesting story, actually, because so Bangladesh was hit really hard in the 1970s with uh, with really problematic pathogens. So they were getting uh, hit with dysentery and typhoid fever and cholera. 
And there were a lot of deaths associated with water because of that. Um, so in 1970, they were like, well, let's build a bunch of wells so we can access cleaner water. And they did. They did access cleaner water. But unfortunately, what they found years and years later was that these wells were high in arsenic. Um, and so many people were dying because of ar arsenic poison decades later. So this is a, an example of what we call bioaccumulation. So this is when you're taking small amounts slowly over time that it's building up in your system. So it might take decades. It might take uh a few years, but that's what bioaccumulation is. That is a single individual, one person, taking a small amount of toxin over a very long period of time. And it accumulates and accumulates until you see um, sort of the consequences of that component. And in this case, it was arsenic versus mercury. So this is where we see biomagnification. And the big difference between that is this is where you see it go from one species to another, depending on consumption. So this hit a bunch of fishing villages in Japan, not recently. I think this was also in like the 80s, maybe the 70s, um, where there were there were an abundance of fishing villages. So they relied entirely on fish. That's all they ate. They were eating like three or four times the amount of fish that a regular person does. And because of that, they were bioaccumulating um, that mercury. But it's technically considered biomagnification because that mercury started in fish. We consumed that fish. And it bioaccumulated in us. So biomagnification is over a series of uh, trophic levels, right? Ecology. Um, and bioaccumulation is in a single uh, individual. Just wanted to state that. Um, and the reason fish in particular have so much mercury is because it's used in a variety of electronic project products. Oh, I don't go more into that. It's used in a bunch of industry products. It's used in so much that we're being filtered out into the ocean that fish were eating, consuming... Uh, mercury, again, through biomagnification. So they were likely eating something that was eating um, some of our filter feeders that were filtering out mercury. And then it was going up these trophic levels, eventually reaching us. And there were fishing villages in Japan where people were dying of mercury poisoning because of this. Um, hard water. Uh, I used, so I used to live out in Pullman when I went to Washington State University. And we had what we called hard water out there. And what they do is they add minerals and they add components to the water out there to help uh, sort of purify it, I guess. Um, you can taste it. It tastes very metallic. Um, but these, a lot of these components can bioaccumulate over time and be very poisonous. And then finally, groundwater pollution. And we've talked plenty about this, but anything essentially leaking into the ground, including um, fuel tanks, septic tanks, agriculture activities, landfills are a big problem. Um, all of these are contaminants. So in 1972, um, the U.S. government was like, all right, we got to figure something out. This is a big problem. So we passed, we actually started passing, we started with this process in I think the 40s. It was early. We started this process in the 40s, but we really enacted it and we um, resolved this issue in 1972. Resolved this issue. Um, we wrote this law in 1972 and it was called the Clean Water Act. And it establishes the basic structure for regulating discharges of pollutants to the waters of the United States and regulating quality standards for surface waters. Under the Clean Water Act, the EPA um, has implemented pollution control programs such as setting wastewater standards for industry. And it's also developed national water quality criteria recommendations for pollutants in surface waters. Very important act. Oh, I didn't realize that was it. Look at that. I guess I did talk a lot today. Okay, but one thing I wanted to point out um, in my screen here um, was this document here. And there's actually several. Uh, I think this was in, I don't know what year this was written. It might have been 2022. It was very recent. But maybe you have heard of giant corporations, uh, particularly in California, um, taking in so much water and you know every year california is in a drought and i have friends living in california they're like oh yeah i had to restrict my water usage today i can only shower every other day um, because of this drought problem but you also see these huge industries in california like pepsi pepsi was a big problem for a long time um big agriculture uh one of the biggest problems was uh hold on it even says it down here almonds almonds are stupid I love almonds as much as the next girl. Don't get me wrong. I think, I think, I know it takes more than a gallon of water to grow a single almond. I want to say it's like three gallons of water to grow a single almond. Um, 
So almonds have been proven to be incredibly problematic if they're growing in a place that isn't a drought. And so these agricultural industries are bringing in all this water um, and taking it away from the local community who needs it. Um, and then, of course, big oil. There are plenty of oil techs down there that are using water. Um, and I just want to make it clear that water is used in these industries as a coolant. And something that I learned, um, hold on, I'm going to stop trying for a second. Something that I learned that I thought was really fascinating um, that I made you do this year too. And, and I really thought about the pros and cons, but I was like, honestly, the way that the world is going, we're going to do this. So chat GPT, as you're familiar, we've used it. You've probably used it a few times to help answer questions. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with chat GPT. It's an AI, right? And it's a generative AI, which means it needs to, it needs huge programs um, and huge buildings uh, to work. Actually, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Hopefully you didn't just witness me struggle with that. I'm pretty sure I paused it. Okay. I'm going to share my screen though. So the reason I went off for a second um, was, so my husband and I went down to Mesa, Arizona last year and it was lovely. I had a friend who had a house down there. She let us stay there. Um, beautiful area but we were driving through mesa arizona which is just outside of phoenix um it's part it's like a suburb of phoenix arizona right um very dry area uh reaches temperatures of 120 degrees in the summer which is gross but one of the things that mesa and phoenix are building are these giant hubs for data centers so this is a 70 million data center in mesa arizona for amazon Oh, it doesn't even say it has Amazon one. When we drove through it, you could also see there was a Google one they were building. Um, there was a was Amazon, Google. It doesn't matter. There were like five or six of these massive fucking hubs because it's flat out there. Um, so they have plenty of space to sort of build these giant data hubs. There's sun. So they're like solar power. They're like, we're green. We're trying to be solar powered. It's great, um, which sounds really fantastic. But one of the things that these programs use is water as a coolant. And you can imagine that in an area like Mesa, Arizona, where it's hot and it reaches 120 degrees in the summer, they need to run a lot of water through their systems as a coolant. Um, and I did this, uh, this talk with about regarding, let's see if I can find it. I'm sorry. I'm not helping with all of these. Is it notes? No, that's not it. Oh, it's this one. Um, so I took this class regarding generative AI in the classroom and like, as a teacher, how do I utilize it? How do I ignore it? How do I, um, help you guys utilize it? And one of the things that they said was chat GPT in and of itself has 200 million active users at any given time of average of those average users uses eight chats or questions per day. But it takes 20 to 50 questions only to generate 100 milliliters of wastewater. So for 50 questions, you're wasting four ounces of water. Um, Chat GPT in and of itself, do doing that math, is wasting approximately 100 million gallons of wastewater a day just to keep these data systems cool. OK, which is significant. And I use ChatGPT. I love ChatGPT. Um, it's definitely a problem that some some kind of generative AI needs to figure out. How do we use how do we utilize water um, without wasting too much of it? The other thing I saw is I was trying I was trying to find these on Google Maps, this image, and I couldn't because um, I don't think they've made it. But look at Mesa, Arizona here. So, we're, uh, so my husband works at the Golf and Country Club in Bellingham and I love him and I support him. Um, and a lot of rich people are members there and they all have homes, which is why we got to stay in Mesa last year. They all have homes in Arizona, second homes. It's like their winter home. Oh, it's cold in Washington. Well, let's just fly down to Mesa and go stay in 80 degree weather in our pool. But you'll know, where do you think a bunch of the water is going in Mesa, Arizona to keep all the rich people happy? I have a lot of issues with golf courses. Um, and my husband and I and I have had many conversations about golf courses and their water usage um, because he's a big golfer. And I was like, well, why can't you just use fake grass? And he's like, it's not the same. Um, and it's not the same because of, you know, the elasticity and the blah, 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 whatever. Um, so fake grass is apparently not an, an option. Um, the good news about Bellingham Golf and Country Club is it's actually in a basin. 
And so it uses the least amount of water for any golf course in Whatcom County. I don't know if it extends outside of Whatcom County, but it did make me feel better when I was like, okay, it uses the less water. Um, but in a place like Mesa, Arizona, look at these golf. This is at least three golf courses, maybe even four. Look at all that water usage. I mean, it's batshit crazy to me. Um, and those aren't the only ones. Uh, look at all this green here. This is all for human usage. Oh, that's a farm, I guess. But like, if you go to a desert location on Google Maps and you look and you see all of this green, that's where we're bringing the water, right? And it's absurd when you're like, why the fuck do we need so much water for a goddamn golf course? Is it really that important? But the problem is uh, a lot of the rules fall into these rich people's hands and a lot of the laws, which we'll talk about next week when we talk about um, uh, policy, which I'm really excited about. Okay, I've been talking a lot. I know this is a long video. I'm just very passionate about it. I apologize. You can watch it at two times speed, so I'm not actually that apologetic. I want to find this. Sorry, it took me all of the taps. So, module eight, your water availability and use. You will have a quiz regarding this video, and I'll probably dive more into my uh, present more than just my presentation because I've done so much passionate spieling. Um, but your homework I'm really excited about, uh, and I hope you are too. I know you have this big project you're working on, so I wanted to keep it kind of light and fluffy. Um, so you're going to watch another documentary. It's not as dark and hopeless as the climate change one was, hopefully. Um, it's called Unique Earth. I actually had my bio class watch it earlier this year when we studied water. Um, they studied the chemistry of water, uh, and you guys are studying sort of the importance of water. But it's it's a really cool documentary regarding how water is utilized in different ways across the globe, not necessarily by humans, but by the environment. Um, so I really loved this uh, documentary. So I'm gonna have you watch it. It's on YouTube. It's free. Some ads. Sorry about that. Um, and then you're gonna write up just a two page essay reflection that you've been doing, um, and you've been doing them really well. And I've been really enjoying reading your reflections. Um, just regarding this documentary. And there are very specific questions in here that I'd like you to consider. So A, I know you watched the documentary, but also uh, that really represent how water is being used. And a pretty simple rubric here. So that is your homework. Easy peasy McPeasy pants. No references, nothing like that. Don't get crazy. Just a simple reflection. And then lab eight. This is, I'm so stoked about this, you guys. I found this uh, this website weeks ago and was like, this is what I'm doing. This is what we're doing for water. God bless Nat Geo. So Nat Geo has this site and I've linked it obviously through here. It's just this website. Um, and it's called The Water Gap. And I think this came out in 2019. It was a huge article they did in 2019 and they turned it into this amazing organized uh, website. And all you're going to do is you're going to scroll down to answer the questions in the lab. It's like a seven page lab, it's chonky, but they're just questions. You're not filling in any tables. You're not really doing anything crazy. There are some, in so you're just scrolling down and answering questions as you scroll. And it should tell you on the lab where to stop. This is one of those. So it's gonna say, uh, it's gonna ask a question about this. And then they'll also have some interactive, like take a guess and you can guess, take your guess and it'll come up with this asks you questions regarding that. And then you're going to scroll, you're going to eventually make it all the way to the bottom. But there are other really cool things as you go to the bottom. This is such a cool site. Like I was so stoked to find this. And you're going to get to, oopsie, did I not make it? Oh no, I did. Uh oh. What happened? Oh, do I got to do that? Hold on, let me refresh. Maybe it just needs a nice refresh. When in doubt, refresh. That's my mantra. There we go. Okay. So you get to this really cool map. It's interactive. You can move stuff around. And this is the water gap map you're going to get to at the very end of the lab. It's essentially showing us where we see water gaps in the world. So you get to see the whole world. It's so cool. I mean, it's really sad, actually. It's kind of depressing. But it's it's a really cool interactive map. Um, and you'll get to look at, uh, it asks you a couple questions. And you you can, the problem is it doesn't tell you what the location is. So hopefully you know this is California. If not, you might have to look at maps that have names of geographic regions, I'm sorry. But California, for instance, has a total gap of five kilometers cubed, um, which means this is a high water gap. This is, and you're gonna look at, see what a water gap is. I'm not gonna define it for you now, but what I will tell you is this, I you can't see where I'm pointing. What you're looking at is you're looking at where that water is going. Um, and in the case of California, most of that water is going to irrigation, okay? 
Um, very minimal is industrial, and then the rest is domestic, and we are domestic. And then the map also has a water demand, which shows us uh, uh, total water demand versus the water gap. Um, oh, and the last thing to note is you have this scrolly thing at the bottom that shows you from 1980 to 2019. And I'm mostly just going to have you scroll back and forth between these two, but the cool thing is you can watch it kind of change throughout the decades. Um, the good news is most of these regions over here are named for you. Uh, if you are like, oh, uh, Eastern Iran is particularly heavy in whatever, just make sure you say Eastern or give me a name, because if you say Iran, there's multiple regions in here that this program is talking about and hopefully you'll understand more of that when you go through the the lab i'm super excited though i found this i was so stoked so i hope this is a fun module for you and not too depressing um but it's a chunky one i know it's a chunky one thanks for listening i'll hang up now because i know you've been trying talking for a while and it's 6 30 i have to drive home um okay email me with any questions or concerns and come visit me in my office and take geology 101 it'll be fun <laughs>